And it's creating that pipeline of tools together, right? So, you know, I said at the beginning, we're, we're focused on these many sharp tools. So it's very much the Unix philosophy of many sharp tools. And there's lots of different kinds of projects out there, some proprietary, some open source. And a lot of them have tried to be everything for, you know, the bug bounty hunter or the red team. And we, we've kind of taken a different approach to say, we're going to have many tools, right? So this is, we've heard us, people have heard us saying things like Subfinder and Nuclei. Um, there's also a tool called HTTPX. So I actually piped those three tools together, right? That was part of a conversation that we had with Brendan O'Leary. Brendan is the head of community at projectdiscovery.io, an organization that builds some of the most widely used hacker tools for both red teams and blue teams. And in this podcast, we're going to discuss exactly those tools, how they came about, who uses them, and why you should know that they exist. That's all coming up in a minute. But first, it's time to take a look at our breach of the week. In this week's breach of the week, we're looking at Western Digital. Western Digital is a California-based drive manufacturer and personal storage solution provider. Mostly what they sell is physical external hard drives and data storage solutions. But they also have a component in the cloud named MyCloud. What we do know is that since Sunday, the MyCloud component of Western Digital has been unreachable and intentionally shut down by the organization. They have released a statement saying that attackers or intruders were able to breach multiple systems and are still infiltrated on their network. Since the breach, Western Digital have released some statements saying that upon discovery of the incident, the company implemented incident response efforts and initiated an investigation with the assistance of leading outside security and forensic experts. We don't know right now exactly what has been affected or how the attackers were able to infiltrate the network and compromise their systems. Being that Western Digital deals with personal data, this could be quite a significant breach. If you are a user of Western Digital products, now should be a very good time to ensure that you don't have sensitive information stored on your physical or cloud drives. And if you do, to limit the damage as much as possible. This will include rotating any passwords that ex are exposed and backing up any data that you still have access to. What is scary at this point is that this almost certainly does have some wide reaching implications. Businesses don't regularly shut down core services for hours, let alone many days. And the MyCloud service has been shut down for at least three days at this point. Because we don't know exactly how the intruders were able to make initial access, what systems are compromised, and ultimately what personal or customer data has been exposed, it's always best to play on the safe side and assume at this stage that your information has been breached. But of course, we will hear more information from Western Digital as their forensic investigation unfolds. And as I said, we don't actually know how the attackers were able to intrude the network of Western Digital, and there's lots of ways that they could have potentially done this, including many tools that they could have used. In today's podcast episode, we're actually going to look at some of those tools that could have been used. We're going to discuss exactly what they are and why you should be using them as part of your red team operations in your organization. So without further ado and more to that conversation, I want to invite Brendan O'Leary, the head of community at projectdiscovery.io to lead us in our conversation. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm currently uh, head of community at a company called Project Discovery, the makers of Nuclei and other open source security tooling. Um, but Dwayne and I go way back to my days at GitLab and maybe even before that. So yeah, really excited to be here. Uh, so yeah, just diving right in there, Project Discovery. Uh, could you just give us a quick, super high level, what, what's Project Discovery all about? Sure. Yeah. So, so Project Discovery, our, uh, here our mission is to democratize security. Uh, and so the way we're doing that is we're focusing on, uh, heavily on having a lot of sharp open source tools uh, that can enable a modern security engineer to get their job done. So, you know, the modern security engineer thinks a lot about how is an attacker going to look at our attack surface or a bad actor or, you know, bad internal actor. 
Uh, and, and then how can I, you know, scan for meaningful vulnerabilities, not just, you know, the world worth of possible false positives, um, but, you know, the things that really are going to be where an attacker is going to be able to gain a hold uh, into my infrastructure. And so we make a lot of really popular tools. Nuclei is probably the most popular uh, that's used for scanning uh, and is able to represent vulnerabilities as code. Uh, there's Nuclei templates are this uh, YAML specification that allows you to kind of define how a vulnerability can be exploited. Uh, and that allows folks to, you know, really clearly communicate and is something that we're excited to bring to the enterprise because we think that it can enable communication between security engineering and the rest of engineering to really find and, and mitigate vulnerabilities and remediate them much quicker. So that's what we're we're doing right now. Yo, the Nuclei is such a, a cool tool. And uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting because obviously we're, we're talking about defense here, but it's actually used by a lot of red teams um, as well. It's a very versatile tool in kind of, uh, you know, discovering, dis discovering project. Was, was it intended as kind of purely a, a blue team, uh, a blue team tool, something for, for defense? Or was it always kind of meant to be that dual purpose, purpose kind of uh, vulnerability scanner? Yeah, that's a great question. I think actually, interestingly enough, it probably started life more on the red team side of things. So our co-founders actually met uh, through GitHub, um, you know, building Nuclei together. Uh, and they were, you know, self-taught, uh, you know, hackers at heart, right? And so they, um, you know, one of ours, our CTO, uh, Sandeep, used to work actually at HackerOne and then was also an independent bug bounty hunter. And so you'll see a lot of, you know, bug bounty hunters using our tooling uh, and then, like you said, many red teams. Uh, but I think that we're kind of seeing the shift where, you know, as a defender, as someone on the blue team, uh, you know, I want to think more like an attacker when I'm, when I'm, you know, trying to defend, right? And so that's why I think we're seeing this advent of the, the word, you know, purple team, right? You know, this concept of kind of bringing together both aspects of offensive security and defensive security uh, to bear on the problem of, you know, these, you know, especially large enterprises have massive online footprints, right? A big thing you hear a lot about just, uh, you know, in today that I, I was kind of surprised about coming into security is just, you know, the attack surface management side of things. Like what's out there? <laughs> what, what DNS records are sitting out there waiting to, you know, have someone take advantage of them? Uh, it's kind of incredible. I actually, so I wasn't a bug bounty hunter before I joined, but I've been trying to kind of like get in that mindset. Uh, and I actually recently submitted my first ever bug bounty hunt uh, or bug bounty <laughs> entry. And it, I can't talk about who it was, but I'll tell you, it was a Fortune 50 company who I own a subdomain of right now. Like I own uh, some subdomain dot this Fortune 50 company dot com. Uh, and it's just surprising to me. Like, and that's just a, the nature of this massive attack surface and and managing that attack surface is actually a big part of it. And so uh, the tools outside of Nuclei we make, like Subfinder and Nabu and, and these other tools, are about that attack service management side of it. And you know what we would say on the red team side, or what we would call on the red team side, or on the bug bounty side, recon. We could call on the blue team side, you know, attack service management. So again, these things are kind of interconnected. I think. I like that term, attack surface uh, management. Um, could you talk a little bit? I know not. You can't talk about specifics. But just the type of attack, the um, sub subdomain hijacking, um, just could you describe that for people that might not be familiar with that type of attack? That was a new concept for me about six months ago, the first time I'd ever even heard anybody doing that. Yeah. So, so the, the concept of a subdomain attack or subdomain takeover is there are a myriad number of ways that a, uh, an organization can accidentally leave a subdomain up for an attacker to take control of. And so, this is actually kind of a not even like a penetrating attack. What it is is we've you know had some subdomain spun up at one point and we had something living there. And then since then we've maybe decommissioned or are transitioning the application that was living there, but the DNS record's still active. And if that DNS record points to something that I as an attacker can go get, that's a big problem. So for instance, you know, Elastic Beanstalk from AWS or the domain at Heroku or Netlify or some of these things where I can specify the subdomain, the domain that I want um, can then mean I can take over, right? So if, if the organization had, 
you know, project discovery dot us east one dot elastic beanstalk dot com pointed to my application dot project discovery dot io and that application's no longer there, but the DNS record's still there. I as an attacker can just log onto my AWS account and take that uh, route. And now I can act as if I'm on really projectdiscovery.io. And then that has weight for extended attacks. Like if I wanted to do a phishing campaign, now even if folks are trying to look like, oh, let me make sure this is on the right domain. It is on the right domain, but it's still owned by an attacker. And so that's a really, it's kind of a dangerous thing, um, but one that comes out of, I think, just again, not being able to manage that attack service really well. It's like, oh, we spun down that application. It's not vulnerable anymore. Well, the DNS record actually can make it very vulnerable to, you know, this kind of extended subdomain takeover attack. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and, and you know what? Uh, whilst we're speaking about some of these tools that you've had, if you want to, <laughs> I don't even know if you realize, but if you want to check out uh, how an attack unfolded uh, using Subfinder and Nuclei, there's a, a hacking group called Sakura Samurai, Samurai who uh, did an attack on the Indian government. Well, I shouldn't say attack. They were an ethical hacking group uh, on, the, on, on the Indian government. And they actually go through... I, I, they should sponsor uh, Project Discovery because I think they use all of your tools in this one hack. And it's really interesting to see what you're talking about, that attack surface mapping and then going in to find vulnerabilities. I mean, this is exactly what this group described to me and and there's videos of it you know where they they start off you know trying to identify all the subdomains using sub finders then trying then they'll actually specifically looking for exposed git repositories and then they'll using nuclei for uh you know other other vulnerabilities in that so uh, it's really really interesting how you you, you know to talk about this and, and people that are wondering you know how on earth did you manage to do that i'm assuming that you use some of these project discovery tools in that research that you did for that bug bounty. I did, I did. And I'm going to write a blog post, right? Like best laid plans of everyone in DevRel. Like I've got a blog post that I'm going to write for sure. Uh, but it will come out. It'll be, you know, how I got my first bug bounty uh, with just PD tools. So that's exactly what I did. And and it's creating that pipeline of tools together, right? So, you know, I said at the beginning, we're, we're focused on these many sharp tools. So it's very much the Unix philosophy of many sharp tools. And there's lots of different kinds of projects out there, some proprietary, some open source. And a lot of them have tried to be everything for you know the bug bounty hunter or the red team. And we, we've kind of taken a different approach to say we're going to have many tools, right? So this is, we've heard us, people have heard us saying things like Subfinder and Nuclei. Um, there's also a tool called HTTPX. So I actually piped those three tools together, right? So Subfinder does passive subdomain uh, discovery. So what it does is it looks at you know various internet uh, databases of subdomains from DNS records and other things, uh, and it finds you know all of those subdomains. So again, if I was looking at projectdiscovery.io, I want to find every subdomain, right? Uh, API.projectdiscovery.io, store.projectdiscovery.io, all the all these things that um, are subdomains of it. And then I used our, our tool, I piped that tool, right? Very Unix-like, right into HTTPX, which is a tool that then looks, you know, are there, is there an HTTP response on the most common ports, right? 80443, but then also like 8443 and like lots of other ports that, that uh, you commonly look for. And then if it gets a response, that tells you something. Or if it gets a DNSX does a similar thing. If it gets that, does this DNS record still exist? That gives you an interesting piece of information. And then you feed that into Nuclei, and then Nuclei runs, well, our Nuclei templates have over 4,500 public templates uh, that folks have contributed, right? And so one of those templates might be, again, going back to the AWS example, Elastic Stock Takeover. Like, does this domain point to Elastic Beanstalk, but doesn't respond to an HTTP request? Thus, this application's down, but the DNS record still exists, right? That Those two things in combination flags, comes back as a, a finding from Nuclei that says this is possibly vulnerable to that attack or this kind of attack. And then you'll find lots of other templates, like the probably the vast majority of our templates are named CVE dash and then the CVE number, right? Like how are, is this, this property vulnerable to this CVE, right? That, um, you know, the classic example here is when log for shell or log for J or whatever you want to, the right way to call that that vulnerability is uh, when that came out within hours there was a nuclei template in the public domain you know to to detect that 
And the difference that makes for folks that are using our tooling is, you know, it takes the proprietary vendors longer than that. In some cases, days, maybe weeks. Maybe that attack's not a great one because I think everyone woke up really quick to that one and probably had it within a few days. But sometimes it can take weeks for, you know, a, a CVE to get translated into a signature that a proprietary tool can recognize versus with Nuclei, A, you might get it from the open source community quickly. And B, you can actually write your own templates. So we have a lot of folks that are using our templates to, you know, write things that they are, are unique to them, right? Um, so, you know, things that are in their application stack that, that they want to be aware of or that they just want to be alerted to. You can write these Nuclei templates, which are super, super flexible. You just define a request or a port or a DNS lookup. Uh, and then it can come back and flag you as a finding. So that's that's really valuable. And then you see lots of folks that have their own custom templates alongside maybe some of our public templates uh, to really make it powerful. So we've been talking a lot about Nuclei on this call, and but you mentioned just briefly there um, HTTPX. I know that's one of the other tools that Project Discovery makes available out there in their open source, open source stack. Um, I'm curious to... How did that evolve? Like, did Nuclei start as the project and then the company grew around that? Or it was asset management, like something else going on entirely? And then you realized we can tie these things together. And I guess it's really a two-part question because the next part would be like, something that I've heard thrown around talking about Nuclei is uh, the concept of intelligent automation. And you talk about like tying these things together, but how should people approach this? Like there are a lot of tools, there's a lot of moving parts, but are you talking about architecting your own system? Just, I know there's a lot in that question, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, no, I'll take a, I'll take a couple stabs at that. Um, so first I think the way that each of these tools evolved, I think Nuclei, pardon the pun on its name, but has really become the center of a lot of these things. Right. Um, and in fact, it, it integrates HTTPX and DNSX right into it now. Um, and there's lots of other tools that we have. And I think each of those tools grew out of a need, right? Again, our, our founders were bug bounty hunters. They were, you know, security engineers at companies that had a very modern take on security engineering, not like kind of the old stuffy guys in suits at RSA buying things from other guys in suits. Um, you know, they, they, they're more of the bearded security engineer that's really trying to understand, you know, the attack surface. And so each of these tools came from a point that you made at the end there, Dwayne, that there's lots of these tools out there, right? Uh, and what they did is they wanted to, you know, again, make them make them sharper, right? So for instance, let's talk about subdomain enumeration. There's lots of tools that do that. Some do it through brute force, which is a lot uh, longer process. Um, and then some do it in passive ways and some do it in both. And we really wanted to build a tool that was sharper and could, you know, by default out of the box, does passive only as quick as possible subdomain enumeration, right? And then yes, you can do more complicated things, but we wanted it to come out of the box for someone who's learning about bug bounty hunting or learning about red teaming or learning about this modern security engineer approach uh, to be able to get at it quickly. And that's, that's where our open source ethos really is with those individual users. Now, when you're talking about, you know, folks setting up this pipeline, you know, then that, that gets more complicated, right? You, if you talk to, a given bug bounty hunter at the top of, you know, bug bounty hunting, I'm sure they could show you their very complex pipeline with a lot of PD tools and a lot of other tools um, that come in. But I think for the enterprise that wants that kind of, you know, again, out of the box, we want it to work. We want this modern security approach, but we don't know, we don't want to like be stitching these things together. That's where we're, we're focusing our efforts on the commercialization side with what we're calling Nuclei Cloud. Uh, and so Nuclei Cloud is something that we're currently released in kind of a, uh, a closed beta uh, for folks to be able to stand up and have a, a GUI and an interface and a scalable way of running these tools against their infrastructure. Uh, and so that's something we're really excited about. It's in the very early days right now, um, but but it's exciting. And we've got a lot of um, you know interest from those in our community who also work at large enterprises and want to bring these tools in and, and make them a part of, of how they, they are doing their security practice. And the other big piece of that is remediation. So again, if I'm the bug bounty hunter, I, I don't want to say I don't care about remediation, but I don't, I, I want to identify the problem and send it to 
the person who's in charge of remediating, right? The company that I'm, I'm doing the bug bounty for, but I don't have any control over that process, right? That then it's up to them. If I'm the enterprise, I want to be able to remediate these things really quickly. Right. And so it's, it's really interesting. Actually, if you look at, um, for instance, Starbucks hacker one bug bounty program, they actually offer more money to a bug bounty hunter if they include a nuclei template with the bounty. Um, and you know, we can only assume that's because Starbucks is then using that template as the way to communicate with engineering and, and, and the ops folks about how and, and why this, this, uh, exploit exists. Uh, and so I think that's where that remediation cycle and kind of having an out of the box, um, way to run those tools together is where we see, you know, an opportunity for the enterprise, us to help the enterprise while also maintaining this amazingly awesome set of open source tools that are focused on the individual user, you know, that community of bug bounty hunters and security professionals that, that are in our community today. Uh, so that's really exciting. All right. Well, let's, let's get into something, something new here that, that I know is on the cards at Project Discovery. Um, and it's there described in just one word, which is chaos, <laughs> which has left me very, very, very curious. But you've talked about kind of piecing these things together. And I really liked what you said about remediation because that's such an important part that I think is is often forgot, not by the organizations because they have to deal with it, but by the vendors, um, by the people building the tools. So, but so what what is what is this offering here that, that I see just chaos? Can you dive into a little bit of, about what that is? Sure. Yeah. No. It's a it's a great term for it, right? The the it it's you know I think the term comes from the the chaos of what we were talking about earlier, right? The chaos of especially if you're a large multinational enterprise the sprawling infrastructure, right? You know, we, we've, we talk about this and I come from the DevOps world, right? We talk about this in the DevOps world. Like we have, you know, microservices and systems everywhere and we can't really human reason against that just because of the scale of what they are, right? If I'm a Fortune 1000 company or, or a large enterprise. And, and so part of that, you know, is, is that attack service management. And there's kind of, again, two ways of looking at that. Is it, is it passive discovery of attack surface, right? Through, you know, known public databases of, of things that, you know, are out there, or is it kind of a more active discovery where we're maybe using common terms to see, does this, you know, does API dot exist? Does test dot, does stage dot, does prod dot, right? Exist for all these things. And so the idea of, again, Subfinder was, was quick, fast, uh, passive, right? And so it hits internet databases um, that ha have uh, information about DNS records and, and other things. Uh, and then chaos is our goal of creating a better active scanner that can then be used by those passive scanners. So chaos will be another data source or can be another data source for subfinder. Um, but it involves our team actually doing active scanning of the entire internet to try and map against uh, these large enterprises that have, you know, bug bounty programs. Uh, so we also keep a, a public repository of bug bounty programs on our GitHub um, that has all the details about what's in scope, what's out of scope, you know, where the bug bounty program exists, if it's bug crowd or yes, we hack or hacker one, uh, or maybe their own bug bounty program on their website. Right. Um, and so for those public bug bounty programs, we want to provide, you know, great attack surface uh, discovery for, again, both individuals who may want to be participating in these bug bounty programs. Um, but then also, I think, of course, it's going to have value for the enterprise um, in discovering their own attack surface and figuring out, you know, what what they're missing um, from where their attack surface is. And again, it's something that I guess I was like a little bit surprised to find out. But then again, if I apply my DevOps hat to it, not that surprised. Like, it seems obvious to me to say, and it's because I'm, you know, an amateur <laughs> software runner. Well, I know every subdomain that is on, you know, boleary.dev or whatever. Um, but, you know, as soon as you scale up to, you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000 software engineers, right? That problem of what's out there, what's production, et cetera, et cetera, becomes a very hard problem to solve. And one you can't really solve with human reasoning anymore easily right? It's not a spreadsheet of all your subdomains. It's got to be more of an automated process to understand what's going on. Yeah. That, so if, if I understand this correctly, chaos is kind of a, a resource. It's a resource for the bounty hunters to be able to kind of gather more information about 
about the, the, the types of organizations, bounties and information about them that they can use to, uh, I guess, you know, launch research. Yeah, start their reconnaissance, right? That that reconnaissance piece of the bug bounty hunting can be, or maybe many times is the longest process, right? What is this? What do these folks have? What's the technology that these things are running? Um, you know, where's WordPress? Where's the, what, you know, uh, WAF are they using? Like all these questions that you're going to have when you start a new, you know, maybe take a look at a new bug bounty program. The idea of chaos is try and like have us spend that time, quote unquote, doing that recon for folks so that they can then have a package of like, here's the latest reconnaissance information for this particular bug bounty program. Um, And when we talk to not only bug bounty hunters, but enterprises that are running bug bounty programs, that's hugely valuable, right? I was talking with a CISO actually just the other day who was saying like, I want to be able to give, especially to the bug bounty hunters that I trust, more and more access to information and inside systems. So that it's not just a, a black box that they're coming at, but a grayer box, because I trust those folks to then use that gray box to expand their footprint and show me vulnerabilities before, you know, someone with bad intentions finds them. So it's really interesting. That's that's really cool. Uh, and, I, and I like that. I love that enterprises see value in this because I see value in this as well for the enterprises. There will be people out there listening that uh, embrace a security by obscurity uh, model, let's say, and you know that that may be listening and other organizations that say, "Hey, I don't want to make it harder for the bug. I don't want to make it easier for the guys doing bug bounties. I want to make it harder for the bad guys. You know, like so, I want to make it harder for everyone. What, do you get pushback from that?" And what's your kind of reasoning to get around that? I think they're probably from the right organization is pushback, right? From an organization who kind of has that stodgy older view of, of security. And maybe again, security through obscurity isn't invalid, I don't think. But if there's public information available out there about your company, then you're not practicing security through obscurity by ignoring it. You're, you're, you're just ignoring <laughs> the fact and assuming there's obscurity, right? Um, so actually identifying what assets are out there and, and available to the internet is really the first step anyone should take, whether you kind of have the security of, by observ- uh, by you know obscurity approach or you have a modern approach where you know we think that and we obviously believe that the you know having bug bounty hunters and encouraging that community to come and do ethical hacking against you is probably one of the best ways to help secure your perimeter. Um, and that's why we see these large enterprises. We see the U S department of defense, right? Very, the number one security b- by obscurity group out there, maybe, um, you know, participating in bug bounty programs, bringing in folks, right? Like, um, in, in Las Vegas every year, there's a big, uh, hacking convention on an air force base. Like, Again, those are folks that are love obscurity <laughs> as part of their security plan, but still see the value in like whatever is exposed. We need to know what that is, right? Because not knowing about it and pretending like it doesn't exist is going to actually harm us more in the end. That's that's a really good segue here toward or wrapping up. Um, thank you very much for, for being on the show today. Uh, but yeah, how would someone that wants to get started you, know, you recently just became a bug bounty hunter yourself. Uh, how would you recommend someone get started with this? If they're like, yeah, this actually resonates with me. I need to be on top of this for my org, or I want to go out and help the community. Where should they start? Yeah. So of course, projectdiscovery.io is a great place to discover more about our tooling. Uh, you can also join our discord server there. There's a lot of folks in there with various levels of um, experience, right? We get folks with brand new questions. We get folks with advanced questions that I look at and I'm like, yep, going to have to get <laughs> like some of our, our serious engineers involved. Uh, so I highly recommend joining that. And then there's lots of other communities too, right? So I learned a lot on YouTube from uh, folks like um, NAMSAC and and Stonk, these these folks that are are content creators focused on the bug bounty community. Um, that, that's a really I learn a lot through YouTube, right? If I'm trying to do almost anything, I, I can find a great YouTube video about it. And I think bug bounty hunting is 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 ripe for that. There's a lot of great content out there. Uh, and then yeah, join these communities again. Namsac has a great Discord. 
Um, and so, you know, get involved and don't feel, um, don't feel like you can't get involved just because you don't know what you're doing. I, I still don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I, I dove in head first. Um, and I, I think that's true of learning any new technology. And so it's kind of my general advice for life, which is, you know, dive in, learn, don't be afraid of asking a stupid question. If you have the question guaranteed, there's 10 other people that aren't speaking up that have the question too. So speak up and ask the question. And, and, uh, I found the community to be very willing and able to help answer those questions. Yeah. I think the security, yeah, the security community is one that's actually really surprisingly welcoming. I think anyone that comes into this for the first time, I think it's quite intimidating from the outside, but once you go on the inside, you realize that actually there's lots of people in your position and everyone has been there. So everyone can relate. Well, I think that takes us to the end of the episode. So Brendan, uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time and being here. Now, if people want to, to learn more about you or follow your articles, I know you speak at conferences, how can people kind of follow you and, and keep up to date with, with what you're up to? Yeah, so probably the best way is on Twitter at O'Leary Crew. Um, but you can also follow my blog directly at boleary.dev, B-O-L-E-A-R-Y.dev. And you can find my links there to like Macedon and LinkedIn and all those other fun places. Um, but I'd be lying if I didn't say mo- I spend most of my time on Twitter still. So find me there. Does, uh, does Boleary.dev have a bug bounty program? If I find a subdomain that's uh, <laughs> unattached, can I, think I-, I should work one out, right? Like. <laughs> I'm going to add a security.txt to it uh, so that you know how to get in touch with it. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, mate. And we'll see you next time.